Good morning, and thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, which will feature a panel discussion on COVID-19 and remote work strategies. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Okay, today's webcast is eligible for 1.5 CPE credit and for the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. To qualify for these credits, you must attend for a minimum of 75 minutes and respond to at least five of the six polling questions. The presentation you're about to see is not legal investment or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I'd like to turn it over to Lori Tisch, Moss Adams Partner and Government Services National Practice Leader to get our session started. Lori? All right, thank you, Amy. I am just going to ask uh, all the presenters, unless you are speaking, to go ahead and mute yourself. We are hearing some feedback. Uh, could I ask a question? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get my camera back on uh, with, since the start of this. And um, Rudy will work with you offline since you're not speaking quite yet. So thanks for letting us know. Today we're going to be focusing on remote work strategies within the public sector. I'm so pleased that we have with us today the following individuals from several different types of governmental entities. First up, we have Gigi Decabias Hughes from the city of Santa Monica. David Pierce with the Solid Waste Enterprise of King County Department of Natural Resources and Parks. Michelle Kirby from the city of Portland. And Rudy Calusa with the, with the Port of Seattle. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for our panel discussion today. This current environment has been challenging for all of us with many organizations implementing remote work strategies in response to the pandemic. Today, we have a panel on COVID-19 and remote work strategies, and you'll get to hear how some of the governmental entities are navigating the remote work environment. Before we dive into the introductions. Here's the format of today's discussion to give you an idea of what to expect. We'll take a few moments for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their background. I'll then kick off the interview asking questions that draw out some of the high-level themes that we should all be thinking about. If you have questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, you can submit your questions using the Q&A inbox. I know that our panelists will be covering a lot of information today, so if we're unable to address your questions, we'll follow up with you after today's session. Our goal is that whatever your role or industry is, that you'll come away with a new idea, a fresh perspective, a new strategy that you can apply in your own organization. Before I introduce our first panelist, 
we are going to have our first polling question. Since today's session qualifies for CPE, our session includes six polling questions. You will need to respond to at least five of these questions to receive CPE credit. Amy, I'm going to pass it on to you to moderate our first question. All right, thank you, Lori. So the first question is, will you continue to work remotely at least part of the time after the pandemic is over? And your options are A, yes, B, no, or C, not sure. And we will leave this up for a few moments for you to respond. To participate, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And I do see some uh, answers coming through via the Q&A inbox. I just want to remind you for CPE credit, you do need to respond within the actual uh, polling question. Okay, Lori, here are the results. All right, not too much of a surprise. It looks like most people are going to work remotely at least part of the time, or they're not quite sure yet. All right, thank you. With that, we are going to go to our first panelist, and that is Gigi with the City of Santa Monica. Gigi, I'm gonna have you just give a real brief background on yourself, and then I'll start firing away. Okay. I'm sorry, I haven't heard anything yet. Gigi, are you connected? I am connected. I am connected. Can you hear me? There you go. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to give a little background on yourself and then I'll have a question for you? Okay, sure. I'm sorry. I'm seeing the uh, circle going on and off, on and off. So hopefully you can hear me. So. Hi, everyone. I'm Gigi DeCavallis Hughes. I'm the uh, Chief Financial Officer for the City of Santa Monica in California. Um, I have actually um, worked for Santa Monica since 1997, um, starting off in budget, and I worked my way around the city for several years before um, joining the finance or rejoining the finance department uh, again about 11 years ago uh, as finance director. Um, we've been through a lot of challenges in, in the city, both financial and, and other types of, of challenges, but obviously uh, COVID has been um, the, the worst of them and something that I think, uh, you know, we've been able to pull out of um, in pretty good shape. Um, and we've, you know, learned a lot of things in, in, in learning how to cope with COVID and how to uh, um, close the city and then as we're reopening it again again. Great. Gigi, can you describe the biggest challenges that the city has faced when the pandemic and the work from home orders hit a year ago? Sure. So, um, you know, like everyone else, um, you know, on March 12th, we were told that we were going home. Uh, March 13th, we weren't going to come back to work. And um, a lot of uh, things that, that seemed impossible became possible. So one of the things um, that I like to talk about is the fact that we had set aside uh, money and our reserves and had been talking for months about how it was going to take us we, we were we had just put in a, a brand new building, a very open office um, type of situation, and we were 
um, not allowed to bring a lot of papers in and we were trying to figure out how we were going to go paperless. We figured it would take us about three to five years to really shift into this uh, remote or into a paperless environment. And uh, obviously, like everyone else, we had to do it in about a weekend. And uh, so it saved us some money in some ways because we were able to use that money to help stabilize um, our general fund. So let me go through some of the operational challenges that we faced. Um, so a city has, you know, we do work very much, um, it's public service, it's one-on-one -on -one work with our public. Um, so obviously when we went to a remote environment, many things had to change. Our libraries had to close. Our inspectors couldn't go out and do inspections. Can I just note, can you hear me? Um, because there's a very big lag on my camera. I just want to make sure that it's coming through okay. You know, I think we're all expecting that. I do want to just ask and remind the presenters to please mute yourself, except for Gigi. The mute button is right above the screen of the speaker. But we are hearing you okay, but there is feedback on this presentation. I think Amy is working behind the scenes to fix that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that it was coming through. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of work that we do that is one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So we had to shift. We put our libraries um, pretty much com not completely online. Um, for several months, we were um, doing uh, entire programs. Our library program was all electronic until we were able to go to curbside pickup, and that's been uh, very successful. Our uh, inspectors, as I mentioned, had to learn to do inspections uh, online with people and um, um, even getting plan check and things like that. Things, you know, a lot of people were fixing their houses during this time and we still needed to have uh, business going through. On the financial piece, uh, we were lucky that we had electronic payment systems already in place. Um, so that wasn't that much of a shift. Um, our audit was all done uh, virtually and it was very successful, um, something that we're not going to go uh, probably shift all the way back to a non-virtual audit in the future. I'll say the um, biggest holdout, at least uh, in my area, has been our workers' compensation area, which is just a holdout in terms of going paperless. Um, they still use fax machines and uh, paper is very important for them. Those are people that actually continue to go into the office um, during the time, but luckily everybody else in the finance department was able to pull out of the office. So it wasn't as as, um, as bad. And I would say that um, in the first 10 days of the pandemic, I think the hardest thing we had to deal with was figuring out how we were going to get manual paychecks to those people that refused to do direct deposit. Um, and we were able to uh, transfer a lot of people onto direct deposit and also to actually streamline our operations. Um, another issue that um, came up that we didn't really appreciate until the pandemic hit was how much uh, the community relies on us for communication. We had to set up um, a hotline, a virtual hotline, uh, so that we could get to the people, to the most vulnerable population in the city. The um, senior population or people who um, don't have English as a first language so that we could let them know what was going on in terms of COVID, what was open and what was closed. And as things got um, very difficult for uh, people losing their jobs or not being able to go out and do grocery shopping or not having the money to, to um, do their grocery shopping, we were able to let people know what resources were available um, for them to survive. Um, so our hotline became a very important thing. And what we did is we took people from other areas that, you know, are people that used to run classes for youth or sports camps, and they became our hotline workers. Um, and on the communication internally became uh, something that we realized we had taken for granted. I'm sure um, that many people went through this. I couldn't, we could not get through our emails in the first few days. 
uh, trying to figure out what new communication processes we could use to keep things going. Um, everything was shifting so much um, early on. Um, and so we've now gotten into um, work groups and we use Skype and uh, a lot of DMing and, and uh, Microsoft Teams. And we've been able to figure out how we can all uh, connect as if we're next door to each other. Um, and the last challenge that I would say um, that was a big one was our internal controls. We, uh, Santa Monica lost about 25% of its revenue stream as part of COVID. We are very much a hospitality based um, uh, local economy. And as visitation came down, obviously because our hotels had to close and our restaurants were closed, our revenue went down as well. So we had to um, cut back our um, budget by about 300 positions, about 20% of our uh, workforce. And so a lot of people were doing new work. And um, last summer and last fall, a lot of what the finance department was doing was retraining people who were in new, uh, had new jobs, had had to take on jobs that other people were doing before to make sure that people understood what our standard processes were on the financial, from a financial standpoint, and what to make sure that we continue to have internal controls and we're training people on our internal controls. So um, that's all in the past, but it's obviously something that we are still, um, that has now become part of our, our new way of working. Um, and we've learned a lot from it. That's great. And you touched on this a little bit, but can you describe a little more how the city's focus and mission had to change? Sure. So um, we actually, as part of uh, our budget that we passed um, last June, we shifted our priorities so that we were focusing on number one, emergency response. The second one was making sure that we were, get, were providing clean and safe services to our community. Uh, and that um, was was a challenge in itself. And then the third one was making sure that economic recovery became um, one of our uh, top um, priorities. And this is, uh, Santa Monica is has always been a wealthy city um, where we our economy has been strong. So this was something new for us to make sure that we were supporting our local economy, our small businesses and, and all of our businesses, our, our hotels to make sure that um, they could make it through this period and that they could come out uh, strong. So those were the, the mission changes, but at the same time, we were also making sure that we were stabilizing our finances. As I said, we lost 25% of our revenue stream and our general fund. So we needed to come up with a way to do all of the work, you know, provide clean and safe services, which frankly were changing on a daily basis. We had a warm day in the summer and everybody went to the beach with no masks. Um, you know, there were no um, protocols because we hadn't anticipated that that was the only place that people could go to last summer in California. Um, so we needed to constantly be shifting, shifting resources, the, the fewer resources that we had because we did have to cut our budget to make sure that we could take care of these most important things. Um, you know, cities don't, necessarily have a reputation for working quickly. Um, and um, COVID has taught us how to uh, turn the ship pretty quickly, how to be nimble. And um, it, the combination of our staff learning how to do things or having ideas on how to do things um, that can focus on emergency response, having clean and safe services and economic recovery um, with less resources and also a city council that is willing to make these quick shifts has been a, a really important piece of, of what we've done. Um, it has been very important to our success as we are able to finally look um, outside of the, deep into the emergency and are looking at a way to reopen. And speaking of reopening, 
adjusting to a new normal. Uh, are you doing any special things to prepare for that? Yes, we have finally shifted into uh, our reopening plan. Um, so one of the things, well, the we're, we're getting ready for our budget um, and we were lucky to get um, federal stimulus money. We uh, received $29 million in federal stimulus funds. Uh, it's nowhere close to the $100 million that we lost um, in revenue, in annual revenue, but it's something. Um, and so armed with that and armed with, you know, the, um, the good news that uh, cases are going down in California, we're able to look at um, starting to reopen up our public areas and uh, our schools are reopening next week uh, or in the next couple of weeks. And so um, our focus now is trying to figure out what comes first. We are anticipating that it's gonna be a phased uh, reopening. We're gonna be opening up our public counters. We're gonna have sports, uh, um, available to kids again. Um, but of course, there's on on the internal side, one of the things that we are talking about a lot is teleworking. Um, we are going to have a very, people were afraid to telework before, managers didn't want to have their staff telework before, and now everyone pretty much wants to stay teleworking. Um, so now we're trying to figure out how we're going to um, figure out who stays home, how long people stay home. We're working on a new telework policy. I can tell you it's a much more generous policy in terms of teleworking than we had in past years. Uh, we're not afraid of it anymore, and we know that we can do it. But at the same time, um, in terms of reopening, staff is also a little concerned about, um, you know, we're, we're going to start seeing more work coming through, more activities, more people out and about. Um, we have fewer staff and there is a little bit of trepidation on that. We are concerned in Santa Monica because we're so hospitality based, our local economy and our revenues aren't anticipated to uh, rebound as quickly as next year. It's going to take three or four years. So we're not going to be able to rehire the staff that we lost. Um, to make up for the added activity immediately. So there is a little bit of a concern there in terms of how we can handle the work that's gonna be coming to us. Um, on the external side, how we work with um, our community, um, we are going to continue to support our local businesses, our vulnerable population, um, those the mission that I talked about, the making sure that we are uh, focusing on economic recovery will continue for a few years. Um, and we also have learned a lot of lessons about what people like. Um, we, as everyone around the country did, did a, had to do a lot of outdoor dining. Well, I don't know that we're going to be um, changing that um, in the very, in, actually for the long term. People love being outside. We've changed a lot of our parking spaces into parklets. Obviously, that's an issue for parking revenue, but we are figuring out new ways to do things that um, we never would have considered um, pre-COVID. Great. Thank you so much, Gigi. And we're now going to turn to our Polling question. We're going to leave this one up a little bit longer. I think some people had to fumble around to figure out how to <laughs> push the answer to the question. So Amy, if you want to go ahead and pull that up. All right. All right. So here is what? the second polling question. And it is, what has been the most prevalent concern for your organization regarding the pandemic? and their options at A through D. So in order to submit your response, you do need to click the button next to the answer. You choose and hit submit. And these will be showing up in your slide view. So um, there are some buttons on the bottom of your console. Uh, you wanna make sure that your slide view is selected if you're not seeing the question. Um, we will leave this up here, like Lori said, for a little bit longer for you to find it. 
So that is A, maintaining consistent cash flow. B, logistical challenges of carrying out day-to-day -day activities due to social distancing restrictions. C, meeting the new needs of constituents or participants. Or D, burnout by staff due to turnover or necessary furloughs and reduction in force. And again, just click on the bubble next to the answer that you want to choose. And I will say, if you have struggles with these polling questions and you feel like you're at risk of not getting your CPE, you just need to let us know that and we can address that for you. All right, here are the results to the question, Lori. Okay, it looks like most chose B, the logistical challenges of carrying out day-to-day -day activities. And the next, the other three were uh, quite popular as well. So I think there's obviously been a lot of concerns that we're all addressing, hence the popularity of, of today's webcast. All right, well, it is now my pleasure to introduce our second panelist. And that is David Pierce with King County Solid Waste Enterprise. And David, I'm going to let you spend just a moment introducing yourself before I ask you the first question. And uh, I'm going to warn you, David, you're going to hear a bit of feedback when you're talking, but my understanding is the attendees can hear you fine. So it's, it's just something us speakers have to put up with a bit today. So go ahead, yeah, David. Yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is David Pierce, uh, King County Solid Waste Enterprise Services Section Manager. Um, I've been with King County uh, since 1998, uh, doing finance predominantly. Uh, I had the pleasure of beginning my work with King County Solid Waste in December 2019. So I was only with uh, Solid Waste for three months, three, three and a half months before we were sent home permanently because of COVID. So. Not only was I getting used to a new job, going through the first um, audit, we became a major fund in 2019. So we, I came on board, I was working with Moss Adams going through an audit and then the pandemic starts and working with, uh, you know, working from home. So yeah, that was, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, but yes, I've been with, Government government finance for almost uh, twenty three years now. So great. Well, David, I do want to explore one thing you mentioned because King County Solid Waste Enterprise has a very unique situation in that your administrative workforce went one hundred percent remote back in June of twenty twenty, and we're talking, I think, permanently remote. So tell us Correct. about some of the challenges you faced under this directive and how these challenges have worked themselves out and been resolved. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've broken the challenges down into three areas because I, I think it's important to address each individually. Uh, when we were first sent home in March, of course, everybody thought it was temporary. And so uh, we all kind of made do. Uh, for instance, I was working from... Uh, a card table because oh, I'll be back in the office by May. So, and so that home office space was the first challenge that uh, we faced when we found out, okay, you're going to be working permanently from home. Uh, then the questions arose, well, what am I going to do about my home office? What about all my ergonomic equipment? Who's going to move it for, you know, who's going to move my ergonomic equipment from the office to my house, or are you going to move it at all? Uh, and, you know, where's my printer? Where's my scanner? So we started looking at our processes. We started looking at creating policies around home office setups, what will be covered, won't, won't be covered. And that really dominated um, the first few months trying to get answers, uh, employees purchasing things and being told, well, it may be re reimbursed, it may not. It depends on depends on what the policy ends up being. So that was definitely, you know, uh, difficult, uh, especially 
for those that had ergonomic challenges, they were only able to do ergonomic assessments via a webcam. So, you know, that can only be so effective when you're moving this camera around your workstation and then maybe grabbing a tape measure and trying to measure things for these evaluators. So we had these home office space issues. And then we also had those employees that said, look, temporarily, I don't mind working from my dining table, but I don't have a workspace long term. So, you know, how are what you know what are we going to do there so and we're still dealing with some of those issues uh, but you know we're tackling these things one at a time trying to have policies like for instance our new policy is anyone hired after september 1st 2020 is required to provide their own home office uh, before that, we were buying desks and having them shipped to uh, employees' homes and uh, or allowing them to come into the office and kind of pilfer and grab what they needed, uh, chairs, desks, file cabinets, you name it. So that was the first air challenge was these home office setups. Another challenge that we faced is that while our administrative staff was put on permanent work from home, our operating staff was not. Uh, you know, we're a solid waste division. You know, we run the transfer stations, the recycling stations. We didn't close during the pandemic. We were running 24 seven. Uh, and it, there, there's this difficult, it almost created uh, a, a little bit of divide because essentially our operations staff are become frontline workers. They're, they're out there every day working, being exposed. And then you have the administrative staff who is working from home. And so it, this you know, we're working on kind of healing that divide and recognizing the contributions and risks that our operations staff, you know, endure on a daily basis. So that definitely was a challenge for our department and one that's ongoing. Um, but it is getting better as as we as we move forward. But it was something that we needed to face. And then the third challenge. Uh, was kind of IT issues. Uh, so you have people working from home and, well, my, my internet's not working today or my laptop's not working today. I, I, my VPN's not working today. And uh, KCIT staff, whereas if you're down in the office and your laptop or your computer's not working, well, they would just pop on up and take a look and see what's going on. They don't do house calls, however, though. So if your laptop's not working and you're rebooting it and you're trying to get it going, we're basically losing productivity of that employee for a day or more as they make an appointment to bring their laptop back downtown from wherever they live to drop it off with KCIT to hopefully pick up another laptop and and make sure that that one works when they bring it back to their home, then making another trip downtown to pick up their repaired laptop. So it, it almost becomes like a given that if you have a any kind of laptop issue that that particular staff person is out of action for a day and a half at least. And so that that is you know challenging. And one of the other challenges uh, and it will be addressed in this question and then in the next question I have is that, you know, we're, we're put on home, 100% work from home. And in fact, most of King County was up until, you know, June or they, are, they still are, but we have this permanent change. But all of a sudden, the county in various departments has said, we're not going to accept hard copies of anything. We want electronic copies of everything which is fine, except for you have staff working from home that don't have access to scanners. And, uh, you know, what do you do to try and get e-copies? So uh, I think that I'll address that further in the next question. But 
those were the three challenge areas that I think really uh, presented themselves to us. Thanks, David. And, and you gave us a hint of what's to come. I'm hoping you can discuss how you've had to modify or develop yeah. new internal controls or policies related to this remote workforce. Definitely, definitely. So as we've got this requirement from the various county departments that we work from that, like for instance, accounts payable has said, we will only receive e-copies of all your submittals uh, for payment. That I loved actually, I think is great because it promotes uh, what we call green where we work. You know, we want to go paperless. We want to do these things and prior to the pandemic, it was hard copy, hard copy, hard copy required from these other departments, but now they're on board and they're saying we want e-copies. And so while we transition to a paperless process and we're making contact with our vendors and, and, and we're, we're coordinating with them of acceptable forms of e-copies, uh, what's the acceptable e-signature. For instance, King County uses DocuSign, that's our vendor, uh, for official e-signature copies. We did have to, you know, have these band-aids of providing scanners to our accounts payable staff. Uh, you know, they're going back downtown, they're picking up mail, bringing it home, they're scanning it, sometimes scanning it at the office if social distancing could be maintained or taking care of it at home. So, you know, you have your e-signature policy, you have um, document type policy, some, you know, obviously the PDF is, is the, what I would think is the industry norm, but a lot of people would send us TIFF files. And uh, so then it's like, okay, everybody needs Adobe Pro now so that we can, everybody at least in, let's say, in the finance section so that we can convert files that don't come in the recommended format to PDF. Um, and then record retention as well. And uh, moving paperless and going with e-copies certainly makes it easier to maintain your records um, no need for these giant uh, file cabinets anymore. Instead, you uh, need obviously more storage. So we've worked with KCIT and and that's kind of countywide where we're increased server storage uh, that increases some of our internal fees, but necessary to keep all these documents uh, for the six year retention period uh, that we have. Um, and then it's education. It's education uh, to all of our internal customers and our ex external customers, explaining, you know, how the new process will go, what the flow is, and getting it out there. And and the difficult part there, or the challenging, I should say, is getting everyone together. Okay, we're going to create an online meeting in Teams or in Zoom, and go with this flow whereas before you know it was much easier hey everybody come down to the conference room we're going to go over this and so it has enhanced our um community i think it's enhanced our communication skills because it definitely requires a lot more interaction with each of your customers to make sure that they understand why and how the process is going to work That's great. Thanks, David. Have, I yes. just want a follow up question. Have your folks adjusted pretty well? We're going on what, seven, eight months now that they've been at home. They have their equipment. Do you feel like the new internal control structure is, has set and, and is in a good spot, or is it still evolving and people are trying I to catch up? <laughs> uh, I, I think that they have adapted. Uh, and what I'm seeing now is once you become comfortable with what I would call a base level of doing that, so we're, we're kind of getting by and we're doing it, people are recognizing just like uh, people are getting more comfortable working from home, more and more processes now we are looking at and saying, hey, how can we, you know, how can we make this a paperless or electronic? So they're they're taking that initiative and going one step further uh, which I think is great uh, because it's it's necessary. This is 
our our we're never going back because people have already moved into the building where we exited out of. So it's not like we have some place to go back to. So it's important for administrative staff to keep that continuous improvement cycle of, of our ways of doing business. So, yes. That's great. All right. Thank you so much, David. Yes. Amy, I'm going to pass it to you to set up our next polling question. Okay, so our third polling question is, has your organization invested in new automated technologies since the pandemic began? Uh, A, yes, B, no, or C, I don't know. And we will leave this up for about 45 seconds to give you some time to respond. And then I also want to take this time to let you know that we will be sending out a, a recording of this presentation to all the attendees tomorrow morning as well. All right. I can't speak to organizations, but I know for myself that going to the local staples for printing and scanning has been my new go-to, my new internal control policy. <laughs> All right, so once again, A is yes, B is no, C is I don't know. Amy, have most of the participants responded yet? Yes, so let me put the results here. Okay, that's interesting. Two thirds have said yes, but there's quite a few that are saying no, our organization really has not changed much, but, you know, possibly those are organizations that already had a lot of automated technologies. So not sure how we have to necessarily read anything into the no answers there. All right. Well, let's turn now to our third panelist, Michelle Kirby with the city of Portland. Michelle, if you could just briefly introduce yourself and then we'll start the questions. Sure, thank you. I started uh, my career many years ago um, in Arizona and uh, particularly at the city of Phoenix where I worked my way up from accountant three to controller. And uh, after many years in the desert, um, we thought it was time to move to a new environment. And so we uh, relocated to the Pacific Northwest and I took the job as controller for the city of Portland. Um, so this was quite a change uh, in uh, the environment, but um, controller in Phoenix, controller in Portland was a smooth transition for me. Um, and that's where, of course, I met Moss Adams was in Portland. And um, so then uh, a year ago, I was um, appointed uh, CFO. And uh, what an interesting time to be uh, uh, a new CFO. But here I am, and we're getting through. So thank you. Yeah, Michelle, I didn't realize your time was so perfect with the pandemic. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> All right, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about communication and the challenges that the city may have faced related to communication strategies. If you could touch on both internal communication to your own employees and council members, and then also communication and messaging to all of your stakeholders, please. Sure. Thank you, Lori. Um, so going back in time a year ago, um, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but it has. And uh, when the emergency was declared, uh, the city of Portland immediately stood up an emergency coordination center, which included a joint information center, which I might refer to um, as JIC, J-I-C, Joint Information Center. Um, so being in the Northwest where 
we um, are expecting the, the big earthquake anytime. Um, actually, I'm surprised it hasn't happened in the last year. But um, uh, we had emergency plans in place. However, they were planning uh, emergencies on the scale of a large, fast-moving emergency, like an earthquake or uh, fires. And in those scenarios, joint information centers are usually one arm of the public information officer's team. And their role is to connect emergency operations to agencies such as the Red Cross, other cities, counties, federal partners, and community networks. So they generally aren't in the lead of communications, but rather a coordination team to keep the information moving to and from. Uh, in our case, our Joint Information Center took on the role of both the public information officers team and the coordination team with outside agencies, as well as an equity check role to confirm that we were communicating with the greatest number of Portlanders possible. So we can't recall specifically why this occurred, but um, overall it's been a good benefit in that we've been able to provide internal and external communication flows in a unified manner. And really um, at all times, um, unified communications is important, but particularly during an emergency, you don't want to be sending out uh, the wrong information. Um, <clears throat> so during um, this time, the single greatest communication challenge was getting things up and running initially. So we had to create the uh, Joint Information Center pretty much from scratch. Uh, Microsoft Teams was rarely used prior to March 2020. And in fact, uh, city employees were using the Teams platform a couple hundred times a month. And we're now using Teams for presentations, for meetings, and uh, regular conversations. And uh, it's nearly uh, 30,000 times per month. But back during uh, March 2020, the initial team of three who stood up the Joint Information Center spent a full three days creating the channels, the work schedules, and figuring out the priorities. Um, also, while the emergency communicate, uh, the emergency coordination center uh, was in person, housed at our emergency management offices, um, the information team became the first one to go virtual, and that's because um, it involved so many people from around the city, and they knew that they wouldn't be able to host them live in person. Um, at the ECC, so uh, that team went virtual before anyone else, any of the other emergency teams did. Um, the next biggest challenge is our commission form of government, what we like to call our unique form of government because we're the only large city in the country with this form of government. And um, we, it, it's hard to imagine, but many decisions had to be made, and we didn't know who had the authority to make that decision. It was challenging working with our various bureaus and elected offices, and that's because here in Portland, each bureau had their own communication team, and they were used to managing their own communication plans. So this was very difficult to restructure and to have the uh, Joint Information Office take the lead on all COVID communications to ensure that there was a singular source of information. And uh, the city of Portland does not have a health, uh, um, health department, but we rely on the county and the state for health services. And so we were taking their information and amplifying it uh, via our networks. And so um, initially announcements were made kind of scattered and inconsistent, but eventually um, T 
team was selected from a variety of bureaus to get good representation from the major bureaus around the city. And this uh, helped them to see that um, it was a benefit to have the coordination and the one source of truth. And as for successes, I think we've learned that having someone with an equity lens on everything really aided our ability to spread messaging more broadly and with more grace overall than many messages that were sent out by other agencies in the area. Our primary platform for communication was our city's COVID-19 website, and this was for both internal and external messaging. But in terms of the larger community messaging, our role again was to amplify the messaging of the health experts. And we also used our um, social media channels to also amplify this messaging. Um, some of the other speakers have spoken to um, the challenges of um, working from home and um, avoiding isolation is something we've been concerned about over the past year. And we have found that small actions by team leaders, such as check-ins, uh, sharing of challenges, creating a safe space uh, to share challenges can make a big difference, especially to someone living at home alone. And in addition, our chief administrative officer has been sending citywide emails uh, to all city employees. And these have become a combination of some personal reflections and information sharing. And also over time, it has evolved into um, video messaging periodically. We see him in a park, for instance, with a mask on, <laughs> um, talking to all the employees. So these various means of staying connected have helped to foster the team culture and um, to let everyone know that we're all in this together uh, during these challenging times. So Michelle, you mentioned you're using Teams for your internal meetings. Do you find that you're getting some efficiencies out of that? Do you think that will continue even after people are back in the office? Uh, I think it's going to have to continue to some extent because we're pretty sure that um, we're most likely going to be in a hybrid of some people working from home and some people working remotely um, or part time. And um, so the main benefit we all think of coming back to the office is um, being able to have the team meetings, the team huddles. Um, and uh, I long for a whiteboard, you know, to, um, <laughs> to have some project meetings. Um, but we're, we're learning a lot about teams and using the chat and the breakout rooms. Um, <clears throat> so I think somebody else said, once you go back, I think Pandora's box has been opened and we're never gonna, uh, we're never gonna be able to be totally in person again. All right, well, the last question I have for you is the same I asked of David. How have you had to modify and develop new policies and controls to navigate the changes related to the pandemic and the work from home order? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so pre-pandemic, um, we thought we had good emergency plans in place and they were <laughs> for what we were expecting. Um, we had a fairly robust set of policies and we did a decent job of trying to keep them updated. Um, many of the offices had switched from desktop computers to laptops and many had begun uh, teleworking at least part-time, but it wasn't prevalent. Uh, we weren't, again, we weren't expecting a pandemic with a long-term impact and I think like David said, um, you know, we thought we'd be back in offices in a few months. <laughs> um, so here we are, we're still not back um, in our offices full time. Well, 
only uh, a few people with uh, very uh, specific needs are back in the offices. Um, so while numerous policies had to be revised, those regarding teleworking and the corresponding areas of workplace safety and remote computer access were the most urgent. Um, these had policies in place, but there was an urgent need to move quickly and adapt them due to these unexpected circumstances. So the, the workplace and the definition of the workplace uh, really changed, right? And um, so someone asked in the chat about multi-state issues. And um, this, we've faced this to some extent because Portland is right across the Columbia River from the state of Washington. And so um, it's not uncommon for people to live in Washington state and then remote in remote in, <laughs> commute in back in the day to uh, Portland to work. And um, so the, um, but Portland, the important thing to know is then the, their main place of work was the city of Portland in Oregon. And so um, now that has changed. And what we're also facing is the fact that some people see that perhaps they can live in Idaho or Hawaii or Texas or somewhere else and do their work. And so we're now facing those questions because that brings up a lot of different, um, a lot of different issues related to workers comp and uh, taxes and com uh, computer equipment. And so we haven't, finalized decisions on that yet, but it certainly was something, again, we weren't really expecting. And so because of these changes, we've uh, required a signed agreement to acknowledge the, the updated policies. And so every employee who's teleworking more than 30 days a month, which is most of us for now, um, do need to have a signed policy agreement uh, in their file. And so the, some of the topics that have been addressed are communication protocols. How do people reach you? How do other uh, stakeholders around the city work, reach you, your colleagues? How does the community customers reach you? Um, also a listing of equipment that you've taken home. And there were a few uh, questions in the chat around equipment and um, we have allowed people to go back into the building and take what they can. Um, interestingly, we just remodeled our main municipal building called the Portland Building, and it had a very open floor plan, and the desks were uh, sit-stand desks. And so we had <clears throat> just gotten rid of <laughs> hundreds of separate sit-stand desks, which now people are wanting at their homes. So uh, it's been a combination of um, take what you can from the office. If it's something you need, if you have a medical need for a sit-stand desk, we'll reimburse you for one, you know, a, a cheap one that you can put on top of your kitchen table or your, your home office uh, setup. Um, information security, of course, uh, we want everyone to acknowledge that the city's um, financial records, the general ledger, uh, customer information, it needs to be maintained securely. Um, workplace safety as far as ergonomics. Um, I have my ergonomic chair, um, someone kindly who works with me who has a truck um, and lives nearby was able to grab my chair when they grabbed their chair. So um, like I said, we've been making do. And um, we also wanted to make sure that everyone acknowledged that it is the supervisor's role and authority to monitor the hours worked and the work product. So while we're trying to be very accommodating, um, 
in that people need some flexibility. Many people have children at home, they're taking care of an ill loved one. And so while we're trying to be um, accommodating, we still need to know when your work is being done and that your work product is as expected. Um, so in response to this question, though, Lori, I, I wanted to also make a general point regarding the value of strong financial management policies. Um, as you all know, uh, policies serve as the blueprint to achieve fiscal stability, and they help guide financial decisions. So again, we were fortunate to have strong financial policies in place when uh, the pandemic hit. And uh, in fact, I reached out to a previous CFO who hired me um, to, to the city of Portland, who retired. And I said, what do I do? You know. <laughs> and uh, one thing he said was, well, you know, look to the policies. We have, you know, a lot of stuff written out that, you know, to help weather um, the rainy days and the bad times. And so um, uh, we... Where am I? Sorry, I lost my notes here. <laughs> um, so during the first several months, right, rev several revenue streams shut down, like Gigi mentioned, um, anything related to um, the travel industry, tourism industry, um, art venues, and um, parking, for instance, and park fees. So it was a scary time. And many ideas were being bounced around about um, how do we get through this? And so it was fortunate then that we did have a set of comprehensive financial management policies in place and ones that covered topic areas such as debt management, cash management, maintenance of reserves, and when we would tap into those reserves. And so um, it was, a great relief to be able to point to these as a reminder. And uh, then it became even more apparent that we were on the right track. Um, when our credit rating on our unlimited tax general obligation debt maintained a AAA rating by Moody's Investor Service, and uh, that was confirmed in May of 2020. And so um, at that time, it was very nice, especially being the, the new CFO. Um, it was a happy day, and uh, you know they cited strong economic fundamentals as a consideration. And so this, the light bulb went on, and I realized that it's important to remind our elected officials of the importance of following policies, and that why we, the, the finance people, sometimes need to politely say no to certain ideas and um, but the rationale of having these conservative principles is to ensure future financial stability. And so I think that's a good reminder for all of us during these interesting times that we find ourselves in. And that's what I had, Lori. Thank you, Michelle. It's a good reminder just for policies and procedures in general. They're, they're often designed for times like this and once something like a pandemic hits, it's kind of late to try and make them up at that point in time. So right. Right. Exactly. very good uh, lesson there for all of us. All right, Amy, I pull up the polling question number four. All right, so the next question is, which transaction cycle do you expect to make the most modifications to? during the pandemic? A, disbursement, B, payroll, C, cash receiving, or D, inventory? And we will leave this up here for a little while to give everyone a chance to respond. My guess is gonna be disbursements, but payroll is probably a Close second. That's my prediction. <laughs> okay, it looks like most everyone has had a chance 
to submit their response. So here are the results. Oh, cash receipts was, was second as opposed to payroll. So there you go. And it's been interesting as an audit haven't seen as dramatic of changes to the internal contractors, I guess, as I would have expected. Certainly there have been some minor modifications, but most of our clients have been able to pivot pretty well with their existing system to adapt to being in a more electronic environment. All right, with that, we have our final panelist, Rudy Kaluza with the Port of Seattle. And Rudy, as with the other panelists, I'm going to have you introduce yourself, and then I have a couple of questions for you. All right, great. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for um, being patient and um, being a participant in this wonderful seminar and opportunity to dialogue and share uh, good perspectives. And thank you very much, Moss Adams, for providing this opportunity for our industry. Uh, I'm Rudy Kaluza, Accounting Director for Port of Seattle. Uh, we operate the port. We operate SeaTac International Airport. We operate Seattle Alaska Cruise. We uh, have uh, marinas uh, as well, Social, Social Bay Marina and others, as well as then we are the home to the commercial fishing industry, Fisherman's Terminal. Uh, we also operate Landside uh, Bell Harbor International Conference Center. And so with regard to how the pandemic could have impacted us, uh, you can kind of get a feel that it's both uh, air, land, and sea. Um, before coming to the Port of Seattle, I worked with the uh, federal government, U.S. Government Accountability Office, uh, performing congressional audits. I landed at King County as well, and I was there um, uh, providing a role as Executive Internal Audit Director for the Executive Branch of King County Government as well as Chief Accounting Officer. And my career also includes my 20 years now with the Port of Seattle uh, as uh, the Accounting and Financial Reporting Director. Thank you. All right, so Rudy, question number one for you. What adjustment in your leadership approach was necessary to successfully lead operations during the uncertainties imposed by the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, I, I find leadership is so important uh, and big difference from operations management. There's a big wall between the two. And when it comes to crisis situations, whether it's operational day to day, uh, something major we face in our operations or life changing and threatening as we have faced in the pandemic, something we have never experienced before in our lives. Uh, uh, with regard to our, our uh, environment, it's really important to, to have solid leadership and, and really demonstrate what you're about. And it isn't that we corral and come together and, and we decide how we're going to be leaders. Uh, you're already a leader and you should know how to go about uh, navigating us through uh, such uncertain situation. Nobody knows, but you got to get up there and be a leader. And so uh, up to this pandemic, every word you say, every step you took, every presence, presence you've made, people have been judging your credibility as a leader, whether you can lead them or not. And this is a time that's going to show uh, and demonstrate what you're all about. And so my approach is basically refocus our leadership uh, commitment. And it's, it's very important, and I stated, to keep our operations running and meet our service delivery mandates. But what's going to be more important than any of that, and I've stated, stated this to my team members, is, is basically that um, the prime directive I'm going to adhere to is we're going to protect your lives and that of your families, and then we'll figure out how to operate in that new context. I said, I'm not going to have everyone come to the office catching something and then going back, perhaps impacting your life partner that you're with, as well as your children, or maybe multi-generational household. I said, that ain't going to happen under my watch. I said, everybody stay home. And uh, what happened was the port, we have already thought this through, and there was an executive policy that um, provided that clarity. Uh, but I stepped forward. I said, we're not coming to work. I said, everybody stay home. We'll figure this out. Uh, because uh, I was not the one thinking the pandemic is going to be over in a couple, three months. I said, uh-uh, it, it ain't going to happen, especially knowing how severe uh, the spread was happening and how irresponsible 
we were an inconsistent and as well as the CDC was didn't even know what this thing was in which we're starting to see even the understanding of it evolving even to date with the variants. So with regard to that, um, we did have uh, a port executive policy, uh, basically uh, work at home unless you are you are customer facing since you're there. So we had that um, evolving very quickly. But I, in terms of the leadership, I, I feel you really need to provide clarity. You have, because everyone is not clear what is going on and how they fit into this thing and what they need to do. So you really need to provide clarity so they can anchor, so we can all anchor on something. And as a leader, you need to demonstrate resilience. It's really important. You have to lead the troops into war, into battle. This is a battle we're facing for our lives, to stay alive. You have to demonstrate resilience no matter what challenge you face. It's really important that you lead the pack uh, and they have confidence in you. You have credibility to be able to lead. The other is basically, don't think you're the boss and you're gonna start making decisions. That's the wrong way because you don't know as much as they don't know, but we can know together the synergy of us working together. And that's the um, principle I adhere to in terms of inclusivity. I have a solid committing to ensure that everyone is included at the table. We're gonna talk about what we're facing, what challenges we're gonna uh, be dealing with and how we're gonna deal with it. Everyone's at the table because we're gonna get good ideas and, and we're gonna figure out what we're gonna be doing. And once we're able to see what's out on the table, it's really important to be very decisive as a leader, okay? You can't wait for what, the organization to make a decision, what are the policies? You already know what needs to happen to run your operations, decide. You're gonna get in trouble, get in trouble. It's all right. Uh, and it's not, I'm not advocating we do anything illegal or anything like that. But there is opportunity at our director level to be able to use discretion as it relates to policies that may not really totally apply in a situation like this, where it's life-threatening and it affects everybody, the world, the nation, the state, the region, even our local operations. You've got to use judgment. And that's where it's really important to make decisions where you feel it's in the best interest of your employees, your team members, operations, and their families, most importantly, as well as well as then when you decide on something, okay, make sure you act on it, be deliberate, and you gotta be the leader to forge through. There are gonna be obstacles that team members are gonna face. You got to be the leader to remove those obstacles so that we can forge through. So team members can feel that they are part of a movement that is going to survive this. And the other thing, and I didn't mention, I, I'm a musician uh, years, I'm professional, I'm working on my smooth jazz CD right now, but, um, and I, I played with Kenny Gorlick, Kenny G for years. Um, you know, as a musician, you don't know what the heck's gonna happen to you up on stage. You just don't know, but you better know your acts. You better know your acts in terms of your instrument you're gonna play. You better play it in the way that's gonna work right. It's like running an orchestra, being part of it. You have to know. And that's where I got my agility, actually. You know, they say mathematics and accounting and all that, but you know, my agility, as street sense too, I grew up in Seattle's inner city. Um, and um, grew up in, in, in rough <laughs> neighborhoods. And, um, you know, I, I learned how to, I learned my street smarts. I learned how to survive. As well as now, as part of um, agility, I learned how to be that agile in terms of situations you're going to face. You don't know, but you got to perform. You got to perform because you got hundreds of people coming to see you and you got to perform your best. I've applied that agility, I've applied that sweet street sense into my leadership approach in terms of embracing people and honoring my commitment to make it happen. And so I feel those are the key areas in terms of clarity, resilience, um, inclusivity, decisiveness, as well as taking action. And then, and then having this agility is, is really important uh, with regard to uh, uncertain times. Now at the Port of Seattle, we're very fortunate to have exceptional leadership all the way across from our port policy makers, our port commission, caring, executive leadership, caring, committed, our port employees, very dedicated to making it all happen. We have a, a base of about 2,000 employees, over 1,000 at SeaTac International Airport port employees. We've got about 10,000 when you include all the tenants and the employees there, as well as the airline workers. Um, in my department, I have a team of 60 in the county financial board department, but uh, I'm so fortunate myself to have such uh, 
great leaders uh, working for my, on my senior team as well as our second tier ops teams and all the team members. There's such a committed culture at the Port of CO that we're, we had the foundation to be able to launch forward. We really did. Uh, as for the port, uh, in terms of the leadership, uh, one solid statement that, that made it is our executive director with the commission, uh, commission support is we are going to preserve everyone's jobs. No one will lose anyone's jobs right now. We're going to make a commitment to work to make that uh, a reality. So that's been a grounding, and no one's been terminated uh, with regard to this. We sure did go through some uh, tight times to, 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 to honor that commitment. But, see, it's about credibility again in terms of leadership. When it, These are very difficult, unusual times we will perhaps never face again. I hope we get out of because we get the uptick of things going on again. And we're starting to maybe roll back to phase two again in Washington State. Um, we're in phase three now, just finally this past week with regard to opening. But it's really important uh, to, to provide a, a solid commitment that folks can anchor on to. Um, so then there was a remote work priority, but the remote work priority was uh, the de final decisions on how to operate was left to the director level in terms of uh, like at my level and uh, throughout the port. The, the main thing is meet operational needs. That's a requirement, but you, how you do it, it's up to you, which is great. And that includes work schedules, flexibility, and really, when we're talking about work schedule and flexibility, we really, really got to be mindful of, it's not this old way of balancing work-life balance. It's about surviving outside of work, your family, you're worried about not catching this thing, you don't want to live in the hospital and, and, and all that stuff. That's one balance. The other is your responsibility at work, and there's so much going on in terms of uncertainty, that's the new balance. And, and so it's the context in which we have to figure out how to work with our team members to help each other figure out the new balance. Um, the other thing uh, that was mentioned with regard to Oregon and working at in Washington, we had a policy stated because uh, as, as we've gone through this prolonged uh, absence out of the office, we, we had a... Um, we, we had to focus on making sure we made a po strong policy statement, no working out of state. We had team members working in Florida or other places and, and until they have, they were, as in the, count, uh, the finance industry, we have uh, payroll tax administration. Washington state has the benefit of no income tax. Uh, Oregon, it is income tax. And, and so we want to make sure that we do not... Um, maybe a little aware allow team members work in Oregon and ignore the, the state uh, income tax laws. So we, we had an absolute policy of no working out of state. You need to reside in Washington state, work in Washington state. We were very sensitive with regard to the um, impact on um, our team members, especially uh, single parent and single parents, as well as even uh, moms and dads trying to work with a life balance trends of children. <laughs> school shut down and then what do you do so as well as we have to care for others that got COVID right and, and then we got to figure out and we get positive too for example so what do we do so we want to make sure that team members are not impacted in terms of not losing their jobs but as well we gave up to a 240 hour of port um, port provided COVID emergency leave so anything related to COVID as well as having to stay home and help uh, with your children's education covered. Got to show that care, that got to show that compassion. Um, along with protecting ourselves when we're at work, you got to go through an employee self-screening, you got to mask up uh, distancing protocols. Financial side, we did some really rigorous uh, assessments of our operating budgets and capital budgets, um, but in a very responsible way. But we made uh, significant budget reductions, but no one lost their jobs. Uh, communication is very important in terms of leadership. Our executive director, portwide communication, every day had an email out, pretty substantial in terms of this is where we are, this is where we're going, this is what we're facing, this is what we're doing about it, because it's really important to get all 2,000 plus employees aligned to a single focus, single communication, single understanding of what is going on. And it was very substantial with regard to that. And then the face to face communication virtually. There are recurring town hall meetings through teams, and the executive team were there and others uh, in, on various subjects, and we keep, kept ourselves engaged with regard to um, 
uh, team member uh, participation, engagement, uh, the synergy of just being together virtually. Uh, we're running a business at uh, Port of Seattle. That's air, land, and sea. And uh, when the pandemic came, I was at the airport. I said, man, what happened to all the people? I mean, it was like 90 plus percent, everything gone. No passengers. It was like ghost town at SeaTac International Airport. And um, then we said, oh, my gosh, our tenants that are relying on the flow of passengers, the revenue to survive. We're talking about car rental agencies. We're, we're talking about taxi drivers. We're, we're talking about the, um, the Ubers and Lyfts. Um, we're talking about the tremendous amount of businesses we have at Central Terminal, and as well as North and South, in terms of our um, uh, gates. Uh, Every, everything just like, wow, what happened? Uh, and, and so we had, and then, and then cruise shut down, right? <laughs> it's still shut down. Uh, you, you can't cruise anymore. So that was shut down for 2020. It shut down for 2021. That's a significant impact, not to the Port of Seattle only, but uh, to the region. Because every time a, a cruise ship docks, we provide millions of revenue opportunities for uh, the region here. And that's that's the purpose of the Port of Seattle's economic uh, engine. Where we create jobs, we create business opportunities, we generate revenue for the region. So we had to figure out what to do. And, and so we worked through uh, very um, de deliberately with our policymakers, our port commission, our executive team, uh, with regard to how do we care for our tenants? Because they're just gonna go bankrupt. And after the pan pandemic, we don't wanna have a ghost town that we cannot provide service to our public. So we had to provide a rent deferred program. So we cannot, by law, Washington State, state uh, the Constitution cannot gift funds. We cannot give away things. When things are owed to us, we've got to collect it. But nothing precludes us from, uh, with the business rationale and explaining the, uh, the consideration to be provided, which basically port sustenance is to defer rent payments. So we got into, and we still are, we get into a very fluid assessment uh, and refining accordingly, and we're starting to see how the pandemic's impacting us. Is it getting better economically or, or not? And we adjust with regard to our rent deferred program. All the airlines were provide the opportunity, all the taxi cab companies, the rental car agencies, all the concessionaires, uh, all of our tenants at the uh, marinas, uh, as well as Fisherman's Terminal, uh, all of the businesses, they were given an opportunity to uh, be considered for, uh, and it's basically trying to help them with the cash flow. And we're doing pretty good. Uh, we're hurting together, but at least we're surviving together. That's the, that's the key thing that's very important, is, is, to, is to hurt together and survive together. So, so Rudy, I'm going to I'm going to have you pause just for a moment, okay. and we're going to do the poll, the last two polling questions. Okay. And then you you mentioned my second question to you was going to be what were some of the key initiatives the port has pursued? You've talked about the right. rent deferral right. program. I'll let mm -hmm. you um, ponder some of the other ones that you want to bring up. We'll have probably five minutes or so left after these two okay. polling questions and then we can that's what what you'll have left to, to finish us out okay so at this point though let's go to polling question number five that is amy has pulled that up onto the screen what specific areas can your organization potentially most benefit from in light of the challenges you're facing a policies and procedures development B, information security. C, new legislation. D, management and organizational review. Or E, all of the above. And Amy, let me know when like most of the respondents have checked in. And I will just mention to everybody, if you missed one polling question, it is okay. You still will get credit if you've answered. I think it's five. But if you had a little glitch in your computer and missed a question or you need uh, relief from this, just uh, let us know afterwards and we can make sure you get that CPE credit. All of the above. Everybody wanted a little of something there. All right, because of the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead to polling question number six before we turn it back to Rudy. Question number six, 
Working remotely has caused me to be A, more efficient with my time. I get more work done now than I used to. B, fatigued and suffering from a lack of work-life balance. C, reflective. There are positive aspects to it, but I'd like to be with my teams at least part of the time. Or D, other or not. Give you a little minute here to check the box. All right, Amy, if you want to show the results. Okay, well, kind of a kind of a mix of all of them. Um, I am encouraged that people do want to be with their teams part of the time. And I also agree, I think I get more work done in a shorter time frame as well. Well, you certainly don't have a commute anymore. <laughs> and it doesn't take as long to get dressed. All right, with that, Rudy, you have four minutes. And I just, I'm hoping you ex can expand on just any additional key initiatives that the port has taken. I, I sure can, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll kind of skip over, well, I'll go quickly over and not go too much in depth in other areas, but uh, communications is really important. You need to step it up, it needs to be fluent, it needs to be um, fluid, it needs to be frequent, ongoing, but it has to be engaging and influencing in terms of the, uh, the purpose of the communication. We really stepped up our frequency of our connects uh, department-wide as well as our senior team leadership team and our ops, it's, it's very important we do that. Uh, the remote, uh, working more from home, we needed to accommodate in every way possible that prime directive I've given is basically we're gonna protect our employees' lives and that of their um, life partners that they're with as well as their children and the family. And so the question I asked is basically, let's identify and mitigate reasons why we have to come to the office. And um, we, we identified several key areas. Uh, we have a lot of t employees on paychecks. Uh, I'm sorry, ACH, uh, direct deposit. But we have many receiving paychecks. And then I had to make a decision, uh, a unilateral one. And I said, I'll get in trouble later. We're going to just stop coming to the office to print paychecks. We're going to find a pay card provider. We're going to mail pay cards to the employees that are receiving paychecks. And uh, we told them, this, this is now your paycheck. It's an electronic paycheck. We're going to load it. Uh, every payday, and you're going to have your money. And, and if you want to look at your pay stub, go online and look at it. But that's it. We're doing it. And we just convert it over. We work with labor relations. We inform them we might be able to get some um, uh, reaction to this, but that's okay. I own it. Uh, it really didn't end up to be any kind of storm. Uh, I think everyone's just happy during the pandemic to, to be able to get paid because um, I talked about the risk. In terms of AP, accounts payable, uh, we had already implemented, we've gone so paperless uh, in our operations over the past uh, recent years. And it's for this situation. If we have an earthquake, we have some kind of disaster. Uh, if we have a pandemic, we didn't think about pandemic, but I'm glad we did. Uh, uh, we, we implemented uh, our online accounts payable system, which is Core 360, and everything's uh, electronic, uh, including workflow, uh, billings from the, the vendors, et cetera. It gets, it's all electronic and it gets inter and then we work in through that. But uh, the reason we came to work is we process all of that in, in our uh, AP system and then we have electronic files that, okay, let's load it into print. I said, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're not gonna make our team members come to the office just to print checks. So we arranged with Wells Fargo, our, our, our prime bank uh, right now, and um, they provide a service. Uh, and so we provided that uh, very fully vetted uh, electronic uh, payment file, put on FTP site, they extract it, they print, this, uh, they, they print the um, uh, accounts payable checks and mail it out for us. Good, everybody stays home. The other areas in terms of accounts receivable billing uh, invoices and statements, okay? Uh, everyone had, to, a lot of team members of revenue services department had to come to the office, um, run the, the invoices and statements and stuff them and mail them. And I said, that ain't happening anymore. I said, that, why risk our lives over that? Uh, and so what we did was uh, we made it a top priority to uh, align with a third party service provider that'll extract our fully vetted, uh, accurate uh, electronic file uh, for um, 
these um, invoices statements. They print them off site, stuff the envelopes, mail them. So those are the key things uh, in, in terms of uh, among many things we, we, we've done, but I just picked three in essence of uh, shortage of time. The other is, and I thank Moss Adams uh, greatly with regard to the priority I made for, we're not coming to the office to, to support audits. We're gonna do it um, uh, remote and Moss Adams is already there. Uh, so thank you so much. We did remote audits. So we're audited by State Auditor's Office for uh, Public Accountability and Legal Compliance. Worked out State Auditor's Office, very supportive. So we're not we haven't come into the office just to support audits either. Uh, the the other area that kind of drove us into think, this. Uh, we're just yes, coming up on our time here, Rudy. So. Okay. All right. So uh, I will end here. I have a, I had a lot to share with regard to what we've done at, at the port as in my department. But uh, I'd be happy for, if you want to give me a call or something. I'm happy to talk to anyone. And you can probably access that number uh, through Moss Adams. I'm very open to sharing the great things that we're doing, great things that we have done. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, I, 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 I sincerely thank Michelle with regard to the uh, mentioning about equity, diversity, inclusion. As leaders, we really got to, we must realize that we are dealing with human beings, okay? And it's not the pandemic that's really tearing us apart. It's for people of color, in terms of black individuals and brown individuals, such as myself. In 2020, we had just a turmoil in terms of uh, our society with regard to how black individuals felt, disrespected, attacked, killed. And then now, as Asians, we are being attacked and killed, especially our Asian, uh, our elders, our, our women, uh, members of our community. As leaders, we really got to be sensitive to and uh, what we do, what decisions we make. We got to show care, and, and it can't be an impersonalized type of leadership. We got to realize the sign of the times right now, and we got to make decisions with, as Michelle mentioned, equity lens. It's really important because for, for those that are privileged, they have not lived racism and impacts of racism, you don't have a clue of what we're going through. When I step out that door, I worry about getting whatever, you know? And, and so I worry about my family uh, as well. And that's what we face as people, black people and brown people, okay? And so at leadership, you really gotta look at things with equity lens. Don't be messing with people right now, you know? Help everybody be at the table together, contribute, be proud of what we're doing, but don't mess with people's lives right now. You gotta support everybody's lives for survival uh, through this. I, I wanted to make that statement. I I'm a significant diversity leader at the Port of Seattle. I've always been at King County as well. And, and um, I, I just wanna emphasize this, that's from the heart here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy, for those final words. And I also want to thank all of our panelists for today. It was a great discussion. You can see on the slide, we have uh, resources listed that you can click into on our Moss Adams web pages. And I also wanna remind you to watch your inbox for future invitations. We have another eight or nine webcasts devoted to governmental entities for the rest of 2021. So those will be coming up soon. And there is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. That is coming up on the screen, or I believe it will be coming out to you afterwards as well. I'm sorry we were not able to get to the many questions that came in through the chat. We are going to be putting together a document that we'll send out to everybody with answers to those questions. And of course, you can reach out to the presenters as well. Thank you so much for joining us today.